Hey everyone, my name is Nick. I've been at Bungie since 2012, and I started as a test lead on the original Destiny before moving into the production engineering group for Destiny 2. Right now, I'm a technical product owner on the engine team. I currently work with engineering teams on cool new technology, like Stadia. So who is this talk for? Well, I'm catering this talk towards developers who are either starting to work on Stadia or who are thinking about jumping in. Anyone generally interested in Stadia is going to get a lot out of this talk. Also, while I'm not an engineer and I won't be showing any code, I will be delving into some fairly technical concepts. That said, I did a dry run of this presentation for a group of producers, and they sort of understood some of the things I said, so even non-technical folks are going to get something out of this. So here's what we're going to cover today. First, I'll explain some of the reasons we decided to port Destiny over to Stadia, and then I'll give a high-level summary of the project. I'll take you through what it's like to develop on a streaming platform like Stadia, and finally, we'll dive into a couple of the more interesting challenges we face in development and how we address them. So first, let's talk about why we decided to bring Destiny to Stadia. So one of our North Stars for Destiny 2 is play it anywhere, anytime. After hearing about how Stadia worked at last year's DDC, we believe that this platform would give us an opportunity to go even further towards that goal of play anywhere. With Stadia, Destiny players can enjoy their hobby on mobile devices, low-end laptops and PCs, and even their TV via Chromecast. Now around this time, we were also on the cusp of releasing our new cross-save feature. With cross-save, players would be able to share their Destiny 2 progress across all supported platforms. All their gear, weapons, loot, any progress they earn is saved across any platform they play on. With this feature, you could raid on PC with your friends one night and then the next day, you could use that same account and character to play with your brother on PS4 using the same gear you just earned that previous night. Now, if you combine the different methods of play that Stadia offers with cross-save, our users have so many more options for enjoying Destiny. They can play Destiny 2 on their high-end PC at night and then, using Stadia, play at work using their mobile phone or laptop. And cross-saves allow them to do that using the same character and progression no matter where they're playing. And that's something I do every day. This combination gets us so much closer to our North Star of Play Anywhere. So another reason we did this is we wanted a chance to work with this exciting technology. Now streaming has been something of a holy grail for years, as the potential it offers is so huge. It could allow players to enjoy our games anywhere, and has the potential to bring in new types of players. It, it could expand that funnel considerably. Google also has a ton of experience with streaming, even 4K streaming with YouTube, and they've got data centers absolutely everywhere, so they're perfectly suited to tackle the cha challenges inherent in game streaming. Now at last year's GDC, several folks from Bungie had the opportunity to play Stadia. Now we went in not really knowing what to expect, but we left really impressed. We were able to play a shooter streaming from a Google data center over Wi-Fi, and it actually felt great. After getting some explanations of the tech, how it worked, and hearing just how committed Google was here, we were convinced. And finally, we were excited to partner with Google. From very early on in our conversations with them, it became clear that Google understood and appreciated our vision for Destiny. So much so that Destiny 2 became the first game included with every purchase of the Stadia Pro subscription. We also saw this as a collaborative effort, and we wanted our feedback on the platform, the technical requirements, and the processes to lead, improve, lead to improvements for every developer. And Google was fully aligned with this, and working closely with their teams has resulted in a much stronger version of Destiny on Stadia, and it's also led to some improvements on the platform itself. All right, so let's take a look at what was actually required to bring this game to the Stadia platform. Now, before we jump in here, I'm going to give a quick history of our engine to give some context. So we started work on the engine around 2009, and we shipped Destiny 1 in 2014 for PS4, Xbox One, Xbox 360, and the PS3. Destiny 2 came out three years later, and we added a Windows version at that time. Now we didn't have a Vulkan build, and our Windows build used DX11. Now I bring that up as if you already have a DX12 version of the game, you're, you've already done some of that lower level work that Vulkan requires, and you'll have a head start. Okay, so let's talk a bit about Stadia's tech stack. Now, at its core, Stadia is built on top of a Linux operating system. It uses Pulse Audio, a readily available open source solution for sound. And it uses Vulkan for rendering. 
Now, because we're going to dive into some Vulkan stuff later on, it's worth explaining this a bit further. So Vulkan is graphic, the graphics API that's used on Stadia. Now, it's essentially the next generation of OpenGL. The biggest difference here between Vulkan and previous generations of graphics APIs is that it's considerably lower level, and that means you have a lot more direct control over the GPU. So on top of all that is the Stadia SDK. Now that includes APIs for play data, save games, input, all the platform level APIs you'd expect. So the really cool thing about this tech stack is a good chunk of it is open source and it's readily, av readily available. So if you wanted to run some initial investigations on how your game or your engine would run on this stuff, you can easily do that. And because it's available, you may already have a build of your game that supports Linux and or Vulkan. Now this was the case for the folks at id, who gave a similar talk to this last year, so be sure to check that out. Now in id's case, for Doom, a lot of the things just worked from the get-go, as they did have that pre-existing Vulkan and Linux support. But for us, the biggest portion of the work was adopting that new Vulkan graphics API. And again, this is because we've got a complex proprietary engine and we hadn't done any of the work towards Vulkan or DX12. Now for a lot of other developers, this probably won't be the case. For example, if you're using Unreal, which already has Vulkan support, you're already way ahead of where we were. So anyway, we split the team up into three groups. We had one group focusing on graphics, one working on services updates, and one group working on the general platform features. Things like controller support, UI, networking, commercialization, the platform technical requirements, etc. So because our game is an online service type game, we don't only have the client to worry about. Now here's a basic version of what the traditional platform setup looks like for Destiny 2. The player runs the game client on a local machine, and that client communicates with our Destiny data center. The data center is responsible for things like sign-on, for character data, and the world servers. Both the client and the Destiny server connect to platform services for things like friends, invites, and commercialization. Now with Stadia, that client moves into the cloud. Obviously, this is a huge, huge, massive change. But in terms of our services, they don't really care about that difference. But one thing we did do is to set up direct peering from our Destiny servers to the Google data centers. Because we communicate directly and not over the internet, we're guaranteed really, really low latency and low levels of packet loss. Now our network model also has some peer-to-peer -peer components where clients communicate direct directly with one another. On Stadia, all that client-to-client -client communication is happening inside the data centers at extremely low latency. Now both of these changes result in overall latency being cut. Now this is gonna be important for general responsiveness, but it also helps mitigate input latency. And that's something we'll touch on a little bit later in this talk. All right. So I've given you a sense of how much work there actually was in terms of graphics, services, general platform features. Now here's the schedule that we followed. We started work at the end of April and we had to submit our final build late October that same year. <laughs> so that gave us around six months to go from absolutely nothing to a final approved build. So let's take a quick look at what the build looked like during the, those various stages, how it progressed over six months. Here's what it looked like after a few weeks of work. We had the main game loop running and we could render, render an embedded model just through GBuffer. A few weeks later, we could actually play through a level. The core graphic systems were up, and we could render things like terrain, skinned objects, and rigid bodies. About a month later, we had more graphics features up and running. We had some basic lighting, we had FX, GPU, CPU particles, the UI was functional, audio was functional, and we could also play the real online version of the game, meaning we had server-to-server -server authentication happening, and you could play with other people. About a month and a half after that, we had all of our features implemented and we're really focused on bugs and optimization. So you're probably thinking to yourself, six months for a game that complex on a brand new streaming platform, that's crazy. <laughs> that's the same thing I thought about a year ago. But here's how we were able to deliver that in such a short amount of time. So first, we had an extremely strong team of engineers, all of whom were experienced in porting. Several had experience importing previous titles, and several had experience porting the actual Destiny engine to other platforms. We also had Linux expertise spread across the team, and while we didn't have specific Vulkan knowledge on the team, we did have three graphics experts who were able to ramp up on Vulkan really, really fast. Here's a more clear breakdown of the team that did this awesome work. We had three dedicated graphics engineers, and we had two platform engineers. We also had one lead engineer who was mostly overhead, but they did some key implementation work as well. 
We also had production support and a dedicated test team. Now, all of those folks were fully dedicated to only this project, but we also relied on some shared Bungie resources, things like the UI team, one of the design teams, services, and our Bungie.net team for work in their respective areas. We also had unbelievable support from Google. This included having a technical account manager on site when questions about an API or platform feature came up or we're running into problems, uh, we get a really, really fast response. We also had a couple of dedicated Google engineers, Chris Glover and Hai Win, who helped us out a ton with debugging, perf optimization, and just general firefighting. Now these folks had a lot of experience helping with other teams ramp up on Stadia, and their knowledge and help was extremely valuable. So obviously, uh, if you're thinking about jumping into Stadia, you shouldn't expect that level of support from Google. Our situation was unique. We were a launch title, and we had a very, very short amount of time to hit that day one launch. That said, since launch, we've transitioned to a more typical uh, partner setup. Our TAMs and the Google engineers are no longer on site, but when we do have questions or running into issues, the team at Google is still extremely responsive and they're helpful. So let's talk about what it's actually like to develop on Stadia. So you're probably familiar what it's like to develop uh, on a console where a developer has a dev kit on their desk. That means every developer working on that platform needs a physical box on their desk. Now, in addition to that, you've probably got a stack of dev kits in some room somewhere reserved for automation. Now, managing all of these physical devices is a huge pain. For example, just keeping them up to date on the same SDK is really difficult. With Stadia, you've got a set of instances within the cloud that you use for development. Now, each of these instances is capable of running your game. You can access these from any PC using your Stadia dev account. Now, obviously, there are plenty of advantages to the system. You can easily organize your instances into different pools, some for engineers, some for QA, some for automation, and managing these are so much easier than physical boxes. For example, you can quickly update an entire pool to a new SDK using a simple command. And seeing which SDK in a pool is using is dead simple. So what does it actually look like for an engineer to develop on this platform? So the development environment should be very familiar. You develop on Windows using Visual Studio, and you compile using the Clang toolchain. When an engineer is ready to run the game, the deployment flow is fully integrated in the Visual Studio, or you can use SSH to transfer all your assets. So when you're ready to run, you reserve one instance, and then you push whatever files you need to that specific instance, again, either through SSH or automatically through VS integration. Then you can play that build from your machine while also connected via the debugger. Now this is the flow that engineers will often use in their typical day-to-day -day work. But there's also a package flow. Now this involves packaging up your loose files build using a simple command. Then you can deploy that package with another command. Now the cool thing here is that this package automatically deploys to every instance within the pool you specify. So after a package is deployed, you can play that build from any PC, a Chromecast, or mobile device using your Stadia dev account. And no matter what instance you're using, that build is available and ready to go. So you can also hook this up to your build machines so that every new build is automatically packaged and deployed. Now this is the flow our QA team uses, and that ensures that every tester is able to get into the previous night's build within seconds of sitting down at their desk in the morning. It's also helpful for engineers. Let's say an engineer wants to test something in the latest build to see if it's their change that broke something. They can be in that latest build within seconds without waiting for any file transfers whatsoever. You're also able to switch to different packages quickly as your environment can support multiple packages at once. So if you're hitting a bug in today's build and you wanna see if it repos in yesterday's or last week's build, you can mount or switch to that build in seconds, repo the issue, and then switch back. So this package flow means you can set up playtest labs extremely quickly. You basically just sit down at a lab PC, open a Chrome browser, sign into your dev account, go to a URL, and that's it. We playtest all the time here at Bungie, and I cannot stress how awesome this flow is for setting up playtests. I could easily see developers relying on their Stadia build for playtests and as a general tool for sharing progress and getting feedback at work. It's truly amazing. So here's another cool benefit of this instance system. So let's say you wanted to run some larger scale tests before a release. Now, normally this would be a huge headache. Maybe you need to rely on publishing QA or some other group who's equipped with the number of consoles required, or maybe you just bite the bullet and buy a bunch of additional kits to do the testing in-house. Either way, this takes time and it's, and it's a pain to organize. With Stadia, 
you can work with your Stadia account manager uh, to temporarily increase the number of instances you have. So you could quickly get up and running and run your tests. So developing in Stadia with kits that are in the cloud is definitely different, and it does take some getting used to, but there are some really cool advantages and features within this new paradigm. All right, let's dive into a few of the interesting challenges we faced. So the challenges here I'm going to talk about are the couple of things I'd want to tell myself if I could somehow go back in time. So pass Nick, if you're watching this presentation right now, you're going to get a lot out of this part. So do not skim it. For everyone else, this is going to be uh, helpful in getting a couple of things on your radar. And you'll see how another developer responded to some really interesting challenges that you might run into. So first up, game feel. Now, one of the aspects of Destiny most appreciated by our players is game feel. Moving through the environment, firing cool weapons, it all feels awesome. And at Bungie, we hold that game feel and everything that goes into the 30 seconds of fun as incredibly important. And that's just something baked into our DNA. So one big question we had going into the Stadia project was how would this actually translate to a streaming platform? Would Destiny still feel like Destiny if it was on Stadia? So the first thing we did here, even before we wrote a line of Stadia specific code, we created a PC build of Destiny 2 with the ability to add input delay to simulate latency. Then we had our sandbox design team, those designers responsible for the run, jump, shoot mechanics, play around with it. We had them play with what we projected as an average amount of latency, and also the worst case amount of latency. So our goal here was just to get an overall sense of how it played and to identify some potential issues we want to address in terms of game feel. And we want to do this early without having to wait for the many disparate systems to be stood up. So we weren't really sure what to expect in this playtest, as these folks, probably more than anyone else in the world, know how Destiny should feel. And they're extremely sensitive to latency. They're so sensitive that one of the designers was actually able to guess within five milliseconds how much latency we're adding. These people are crazy. Anyway, when playing at the average amount of latency, the overall sentiment was that the latency could be felt, but it was definitely playable and you quickly adjusted. Now, considering that these are the most sensitive designers in the studio, that was good to hear. When playing at slightly beyond the projected worst case, the feedback was less positive. They identified some issues with oversteering, and some issues with the magnetism that we use when playing with a controller. Now, both of these issues made it a bit more difficult to play, but it was still playable. Again, this was a contrived example, and our projected worst case latency was pretty conservative. But that said, after this experiment, we felt that if we aimed to hit that average case experience and hopefully pushed a bit beyond it, the game would feel good on the platform. So at this point, our plan was to focus on latency and do as much as possible to cut that down. Now, Stadia itself provides some dials to help with this. For example, there's a Stadia Steam Profile API, which allows for customization of the encoder. Now, we cranked nearly all of these dials towards low latency. We also targeted 60 frames per second. Destiny 2 runs at 30 FPS on consoles, but 60 would have the amount of latency, so we felt this was an absolute requirement for Stadia. Now, not only did we need to hit 60, we also needed to hit an extremely stable 60. Now at Bungie, we've always held a high bar for performance. We've got a perf automation test team who runs perf heartbeat tests on our most strenuous scenarios to identify regressions quickly. That said, the Stadia build needed to meet our existing bar and go slightly above. And this is because of how Stadia streaming tech works. So I'm gonna give a quick Cliff Notes version of how the streamer works, but I do recommend you check out the Stadia streaming tech deep dive talk that's up on YouTube for more info here. Okay, obviously, the Stadia streamer tech includes a lot of crazy magic that I don't really understand, but the basic principles are still, uh, they still apply. So first, the encoder sends a frame that has everything in it. This is the iframe. Because it includes everything, it's huge and it takes longer to transmit. Now after that, it'll only send what's changed. The P frames contain only the difference between the previous frame. Now the P-frame size will vary based on the size of the difference, but they're usually much, much smaller and thus faster to transmit. So what you want here is to only send those P-frames and keep that loop between the encoder and the client feedback extremely tight. Now as long as nothing bad happens, it does continue to just send P-frames. Now one such bad thing is a severe networking event. Now that would cause frame data to be lost and would require new full I-frames to catch up. The game dropping frames is another such bad thing. If the streamer isn't getting 60 frames every second, it'll try to catch up and it'll send more data, more iframes. Now, if both of these happen at the same time, 
the player will perceive stuttering and an increase in latency, and basically their experience will just suffer. So what this all boils down to is it's extremely important to keep your frame rate stable. Google has technical certification requirements around this, so it's worth reading through that documentation early. In order to hit this high bar, we dedicated around one person month of time for optimization. Now we did this just as our final graphics features were being implemented. Now thankfully, we've got an engineer here at Bungie, Jason Horner, who's extremely good at diving into code and identifying opportunities for optimization. And we also had help from a Google engineer, Jean-Noël Morissette, and his work in this area was greatly appreciated. JN was able to identify some really important gains. Now after this month of time, we were able to save several milliseconds off of our 16 millisecond frame, and we were much, much more confident of hitting that bar that was required. So at this point, we've got all of our features implemented. We've just come a long way in terms of performance. It's time to get back into the playtest lab, see how this thing feels. So we had several playtests around this time, and the feedback was mostly great. Players, especially those who had played early builds, were really impressed with how far it had come and how good it was actually feeling. However, the feedback was not all positive. There are a few people who reported feelings of motion sickness after playing, and in two cases, these were people who had never exhibited that before. So this was extremely worrying. Now, these were only a few people who complained, but it was a significant percentage. And because we didn't want people throwing up all over their brand new Stadia controllers, we needed to take a look at what the heck was causing this. So after quite a bit of digging, both from our lead engineer, Andy Firth, and Google engineers, Catherine Wu and Chris Glover, we identified a couple of issues with the present mode we were using on Destiny. Now the first thing was just a bug. We were using the NTSC refresh rate, which is slightly lower than 60, while Stadia used exactly 60. Now this caused a constant cycling between the refresh and the latency we when we present and when the present is actually used. Now the player facing result of this was that created additional noise, and that likely contributed to the feelings of motion sickness in some people. Now, the other thing we found was a problem in our present mode. All right, so uh, this, is a uh, this is what our frame looks like. Now, there's a lot going on here, but the thing to focus here on is the latency between where we read the controller and the final output of the frame. That gap you see there is the present margin. Now, the available set of options uh, for present on Stadia required us to estimate what our performance profile would be like in the upcoming frame. And what that resulted in was an offset dynamic, meaning it could change from frame to frame. So here are four sequential frames that show this. Now, all of these have variable offsets due to workload changes. Now, the result here is those varying gaps, and that makes the input feel just wrong because we're not sampling at a deterministic rate. Now, the user would say this just feels laggy or choppy. Now, at this point, Chris Glover, a Google engineer, recommended we look into the immediate mode present option. Now this wasn't a fully supported mode at the time, and thus we hadn't really considered it. And one of the reasons it wasn't supported is that it requires the game to run at an extremely stable 60, because the system trusts and requires that the title send the frames at a 60 hertz average. But because we had just done a ton of work to optimize our frame rate, it seemed like a potential option. Now, as we investigated this further, it became clear that this would have a dramatic impact. So here's a diagram of the same workloads as the previous, but using the new immediate mode. Now, the key difference here is that the present margin completely disappears. There's no more added latency, and the encoder can just send the frames as is when they're ready. Now, this makes the game feel so much more smooth, and it eliminates the risk of feeling motion sickness in players. It also makes the game feel a ton more responsive, because this just basically removes a significant amount of latency. So for us, uh, arriving to this conclusion was painful and it took a lot of time and help from Google engineers. But the good news for you folks is that using immediate mode is now the re recommended presentation mode. Now Stadia's Vulkan best practices documentation covers this, so be sure to read those docs as you begin to dive into this area. So after all this work, we ran one final play test and the feedback was extremely positive. Though again, because we have people who really know their destiny, many could feel a difference, but even they were impressed. And most importantly, those folks who were affected by feelings of motion sickness reported no such thing in this latest build. Yay! So what else did we actually change in terms of game feel? Well, we had our sandbox design team investigate the Stadia controller and decide on what controller curves to use for that new hardware. But we already had existing curves for every other supported controller, like PS4 and Xbox, so we didn't really need to do additional work there. And while we were really worried that we'd have to change a lot of things like aim magnetism or tweak curves to fight oversteer, 
we really didn't need to do that as everything just seemed to work. Now again, this is due in large part to the crazy latency magic that Stadia uses. All right, so the next challenge we're gonna dive into here is related to Vulkan pipelines and the pipeline cache. So again, Vulkan is the graphics API that Stadia uses. And one of the biggest differences here is that it's considerably lower level. Now the advantage here is important. It has lower overhead and that added control means more customization specific to your engine. And one of the core concepts here is graphics pipelines. So you may be thinking that this is just another name for shaders and the shader cache you use on D3D11. It is much more than that. Yes, a pipeline object contains the shader data, but you have so much more. The shader modules, the fixed functions, the render passes. The graphics pipeline is this entire series of steps to take the vertices of your textures and your meshes all the way to pixels rendering. Now the cool thing here about this system and why it exists is it allows you to run the operations needed to draw something well before you need it. Okay. So how are these things actually created? Now, this is a simplistic breakdown, but it's gonna give you enough context to understand the challenges we face. So a draw call queues up the creation of a pipeline and the actual creation process, it takes time and it's slow. In assessing thousands of Destiny 2 creation times, the average is around 12 milliseconds. So obviously you're not gonna be building these things on demand. Now the good news here is once it's created, it's cached off and you can reuse it for future calls. So this is what it ends up looking like. When a pipeline is required, we check the cache to see if it already exists. If so, great, use it. Retrieving from the cache is an order of magnitude faster than creating it. And if it doesn't exist in the cache, create it and store it for future needs. Now, the other thing that helps here is the ability to dump that cache into an offline file. That's the offline pipeline cache file. Again, this might ring some bells being similar to the shader cache, but it's much more information than the shader cache. Anyway. You can then load this file up when you start the game to pre-populate the cache. Now the idea here is to fill that offline file with all of the pipelines in your game so that you never have to eat the high cost of creating a pipeline on the fly. And when you submit your final build for publishing on Stadia, you'll almost certainly include one of these offline cache files and there are certification requirements around this. Now for most games, building this offline cache file is probably pretty straightforward. Maybe your game is smaller and playing through the game is reasonable. Maybe you can write a script that loads all your content. Now for Destiny, this is not straightforward for a couple of reasons. First, we have 3.2 metric tons of content. Now that number might not mean a lot to you, so let me give some further context. Destiny has many destinations. Now these are planets, moons, etc. Each destination has unique palettes of materials and objects and effects. Each destination is comprised of many large spaces. We call these bubbles. And these bubbles are usually connected to other bubbles. Now here's one average size bubble zoomed out. And this is the same bubble zoomed in a bit, so you can appreciate just how big these massive spaces are. Now each bubble has unique components and thus unique pipelines. And there are hundreds of bubbles in the game. We also have many combatant races. All use different materials and effects, more pipelines. Each combatant race has around a half dozen main archetypes with dozens of variants of each archetype. Again, each uses unique materials and effects and thus more pipelines. Our game has three character classes, and each of these three has multiple subclasses, each with different abilities, grenades, each with unique effects. And then there's the gear. We have thousands of pieces of gear, from weapons to armor pieces, chest, leg, arms, helmets, go shells, vehicles, and more. Also, there are hundreds of activities in game, missions, adventures, quests, raids, strikes, etc., all with unique components. So obviously, having a human play through everything in Destiny 2 is just not feasible. But what about some automated system for loading all the content? Unfortunately, for our game, that's not easy. We can automate the loading of the hundreds of bubbles in game. That's easy and we do that. So the environment pipelines are mostly covered. But a huge chunk of the other pipelines in Destiny are dependent on lots of additional context. For example, what activity you're playing, what character class you're using, which abilities and modifiers you're using, which weapon you're using, which combatants you're engaging, etc. All these different variables could introduce new inputs and result in completely unique or somewhat unique pipelines, a combinatorial, ex combinatorial explosion. So we need some other solutions here. Now, as I said, a lot of the inputs necessary to generate a pipeline aren't available until runtime, but we do get a lot of the context needed well before draw time. So one of our senior graphics engineers, Mark Davis, implemented a system where pipelines are asynchronously generated at certain points in the game. 
So how does this work? Well, here are two examples of the points where we're loading lots of data. So first, at initial game launch, we load what we call global data. Now this includes things like UI, player, character data. And also, when a player launches into a level, we load things like the environment, the combatants, and activity data. So the idea here is to generate some of the pipelines at times like this, when we're loading a bunch of data in context and when the player is not going to notice it. So let's take a look at this system in action. Now first, as a baseline, here's a video of our game running with absolutely no pipeline cache file. So you're gonna notice a lot of hitches because every pipeline is being generated on the fly when it's needed. Again, you'd never see this in the wild, but it helps illustrate just how important it is not to have to build these things on the fly. Now here's the worst case, this grenade explosion slowed down for a painful illustration. <laughs> All right, so let's see that same thing with our pre-create system enabled. Again, there's absolutely no pipeline cache file loaded here. We're starting with zero pre-built pre -built pipelines, meaning everything's gonna be built on, uh, either asynchronously or on the fly. Now, here's the game start. So the highlighted section here shows the current active queue of pipelines in yellow, and then the total number of pipelines generated thus far in blue. So first, it loads all the global pipelines, then everything associated with the level. Now that we're actually running in game, you'll notice it's much, much smoother. And that's because at those load points, it actually generated most of the pipelines needed. So uh, as you can notice, there's almost no hitching, but the biggest test here is that grenade toss. So let's see how well we do here. All right, pretty smooth. And again, this is with absolutely no pre-built cache. But the fact that there's no hitching there means the system is working. So because this pre-create system is so effective, we have it enabled at all times. And really, this system acts as a fallback in case we miss some pipelines from our offline cache file. Now, when it comes to populating that offline cache file that we submit with our final build, we rely on automation to load all the hundreds of bubbles in the game and unfortunately, we also need to do some manual playthroughs of activities. Why do we need to do this? Well, while the pre-create system helps us gather a lot of the pipelines, it doesn't help us gather everything we get from actually playing through an activity. For example, one of our raids, which features a ton of unique content and modifiers. Now, a lot of this pinnacle content has this problem, and we just cannot risk that this type of content has hitches, and automating it is extremely difficult. So that's the plan for the final shipping offline pipeline cache file the one we shipped in November. But Destiny 2 is a live game. We're constantly releasing new updates and new content into the game. And that means new pipelines that we need to add to our offline cache. So thankfully, there's a method provided for adding to the cache file. So what our release test team does here is they generate pipelines for the new seasonal content, they dump it out, and then they add it to our existing cache file and run a deduplication step to make sure we're not doubling up on anything. Now that step is important because that offline cache file needs to be loaded into memory so it just can't grow infinitely. Also, while this plan for our pipeline cache is acceptable, it's by no means perfect. And there's some risk that we miss things and hitches get through to the user. So to combat that, we built an a monitoring system. So anytime a tester or developer completes an any activity on Stadia, we upload data about pipelines. We track different types of cache hits, cache misses, and the speed of both. We have a dashboard for viewing this data so we can deep dive into the results, and we have alerts built in if we uh, exceed thresholds. All right, so we talked about why we decided to bring our title to this exciting new platform. We described what it was actually involved and what it's like to develop on Stadia. We also dove into some interesting challenges that'll hopefully help future Stadia devs. Now it's time to wrap this thing up. So getting an awesome version of Destiny 2 onto Stadia in six months was a crazy whirlwind experience and we really couldn't have done it without a ton of help from Google and the many folks on the Stadia team. Working with those teams was great and we're really proud of the title we shipped and the experience we delivered to our Destiny users. And a lot of our players agree. <laughs> Here's one of my absolute favorite quotes off the Destiny 2 Reddit. Now, I love this for obvious reasons, but it also mirrors our own experience with this platform. It is so easy to be skeptical about something as difficult as streaming video games over the internet, but in the end, through a ton of hard work from many dedicated people, that mofo is as smooth as hell. Thanks.